It was an unusual day when my typically reclusive husband stepped outside, and the intercom blared unexpectedly. When I opened the door, I was met by my mother-in-law, who wasted no time with pleasantries. Let's be honest, she said, her tone cutting. My son has a well-paying job, while you're currently unemployed, spending your days aimlessly. This isn't a good match. From now on, I've decided to live here with him, so I'm asking you to leave. Her harsh words hung in the air, leaving me speechless. I'm sorry, I was busy working and didn't hear the doorbell, I replied, trying to maintain my composure. You're lying to me again, she shot back, her voice dripping with disdain. I know all about your so-called work, your failure to manage the household, and how you waste your days doing nothing. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change the facts, I countered, my anger rising. With a smirk, she waved a document in front of me. Do you know what this is? she asked, her eyes gleaming with triumph. What is it? I inquired, a knot tightening in my stomach. These are divorce papers, already filled out by my son. He doesn't want to be with you anymore. Now sign here and leave, she demanded, her gaze unwavering. I felt my heart race as I stared at the papers, my hands trembling around the pen. It was a stark contrast to the unwarranted joy on my mother-in-law's face, wistfully unaware of the turmoil I was experiencing. My name is Samantha, and I'm a freelance writer and editor who works from home. A few years ago, I was employed at a publishing company where I gained invaluable experience that helped me build a steady income. I had been diligent saving a considerable amount of money, which allowed me to live comfortably, even in the unpredictable world of freelancing. I met my husband, Kevin, while working at the publishing company. At that time, I was a fledgling editor, and he was an aspiring writer. We both made our share of mistakes and faced numerous challenges, but like me, Kevin never gave up. His perseverance and commitment to his craft not only inspired me but also drew us closer together. After several years of dating, we got married, and I transitioned from my corporate job to freelancing. The early days of our marriage were filled with hope, although I wasn't yet fully established as a freelancer and Kevin was still chasing his dream. We supported each other immensely, sharing household chores and splitting living expenses evenly. A couple of years into our marriage, my freelance business began to stabilize. It was around this time that Kevin started portraying himself as a successful writer to his parents. The reality, however, was far different. Despite his relentless efforts, he faced repeated rejections from publishers. No matter how many applications he submitted, success seemed just out of reach. He often made it only to the second round of selections for writing opportunities. I knew he wanted to reassure his parents, understanding how worried they would be if they realized the extent of his struggles to achieve his dream. Out of respect for Kevin's feelings, I remained silent and went along with the story he told at my in-law's house. At first, all I had to do was smile and nod. But as time went on and Kevin continued to present himself as a successful author, I started to feel increasingly uneasy during our visits. Not only did his parents fully believe in his tales of triumph, but they also began to view me as a non-contributing, stay-at-home spouse. In their eyes, I was a useless wife, entirely dependent on my supposedly successful husband. The concept of working from home as a freelancer was likely difficult for them to grasp, especially since they were unfamiliar with this style of work. While I tried not to blame them for their lack of understanding, their attitude towards me worsened over time. Whenever I visited my in-laws, they confronted me with accusations, questioning how a wife who neither worked outside the home nor did household chores could face her husband's family. I had explained countless times that I was a freelancer, which meant I worked from home. The division of household chores was something Kevin and I had agreed upon when we married. I don't see how you can criticize me when you don't even understand my job, I would argue. They insisted that I didn't have a real job, that I didn't earn much, and that Kevin was the one supporting me financially. In truth, I earned a decent income and contributed equally to our expenses. The retorts continued, with them asserting that if I didn't start showing more appreciation for Kevin and acting more grateful, I shouldn't be surprised if he decided to leave me one day. Despite their harsh words, I knew the truth about our financial and emotional partnership, and I remained steadfast in my commitment to our shared life, even under the weight of their misunderstandings. The conversation always circled back to the same theme. If Kevin leaves you, you won't be able to support yourself. I nearly sighed out loud at these words but restrained myself. 
I want to clarify that I was actually the one covering most of our living expenses and handling the majority of the household chores. Contrary to their beliefs, it was Kevin who was unemployed and contributing little at home. Yet I held back those words. Initially, I only faced snide remarks when Kevin wasn't around. However, the situation escalated recently during a dinner at my in-law's house. Kevin and I arrived together, but they had prepared a meal only for him, neglecting to set a place for me at the table. This exclusion had become routine, and it felt as if they were spreading unfavorable opinions about me to our relatives during family gatherings, which happened only a few times a year. They would whisper and gossip about me behind my back. While I wasn't saddened by my in-law's attitude, I grew increasingly frustrated with Kevin for merely sitting back, observing silently, and not intervening. To complicate matters further, my in-laws, under the false impression that Kevin was a successful writer, continuously urged him to buy things for them. Eager to maintain a good impression, Kevin acquiesced to their requests. As a result, I found myself inadvertently spending nearly $22,000 a month on my in-laws, all drawn directly from my earnings. Kevin would take money from my bank account and wallet without my prior consent. At first, I turned a blind eye to the smaller amounts, but as the expenses ballooned, it became impossible to ignore. One day, I confronted Kevin. Please don't spend my money without asking me first. His response was a look of annoyance as if my requests were unreasonable. This reaction deepened my concern about our financial boundaries and his respect for my contributions to our shared life. You work from home, so you have an easy job, right? It's like you're just playing around and making money, Kevin accused mockingly. Since it's so easy for you to earn money by playing around, why not spend a bit on my mom? Don't be stingy. Kevin, do you really see my job that way? I asked, shocked. Yes, I think it's an easy job because you get paid to stay at home every day, he replied nonchalantly. I couldn't believe he thought so little of my work. As he walked away, laughing loudly, I realized I had reached my breaking point. I could no longer endure this treatment. It was then that I decided I would divorce him. I had always believed Kevin was my ally, no matter what my in-laws said, encouraging me to give my best. But now, even he was ridiculing me. I was painfully aware that while Kevin spent hours in his room, he wasn't working on his manuscript. Instead, he was playing computer games. When we first met, he was serious about his writing, always eager to craft something compelling. The dedicated Kevin I had loved seemed to have vanished. Resolved, I began secretly searching for a one-bedroom apartment, determined to find a new home for myself. I quietly organized my personal belongings, preparing for the moment I would leave. After a while, I found a promising apartment and had already visited it to ensure it was what I needed. One day, while Kevin was out, my mother-in-law arrived at our house. She rang the intercom with an eagerness that felt intrusive. As soon as I opened the door, she strode in and made herself comfortable on the sofa in the living room, as if it were her own home. Samantha, you need to get the hell out of this house, she demanded bluntly. What are you talking about? I asked, confused by the sudden accusation. I've been telling you for a long time that you're unemployed and don't contribute to the household chores. You're nothing but a useless wife, my mother-in-law asserted sharply. There's no way Kevin, a successful writer, is compatible with someone like you. I tried to interject, but she cut me off. If you leave this house, I'll move in. That way, I can cook for Kevin every day without having to look after that woman, Kevin's grandmother. She's incredibly picky about how food is seasoned and complains about dust when I clean. I can't live with her anymore, so I've decided to stay here with Kevin and send her to a nursing home. How do you plan to pay for a nursing home? I questioned, trying to keep my composure. I'll just have Kevin handle it. He's making plenty of money, so it shouldn't be too hard for him, she replied casually. But you're in the way, so will you please just get out? With that, she thrust a set of divorce papers in front of me. Why do you have those? I demanded, stunned. I made him fill them out a while ago. I told him to divorce you as soon as possible, she said, a smug, unpleasant smile spreading across her face. I examined the divorce papers, and to my surprise, they were indeed written in Kevin's handwriting. Strangely, this revelation brought me a sense of relief. I had been ready to move out but was uncertain about how the divorce would unfold. I had expected Kevin to be reluctant to end our marriage, to cling to the love we once shared, and to resist signing the papers. I had braced myself for a long discussion and possibly a contentious battle with him. 
Now, it seemed things might proceed more swiftly and smoothly than I had anticipated. Finding the divorce papers already filled out felt surprisingly fortunate. Without hesitation, I accepted them and signed quickly. My mother-in-law appeared taken aback but quickly regained her composure. Now get out of here and leave the furniture behind. Everything was purchased with Kevin's money, so I don't think you should take anything with you, she said, laughing loudly as she spoke. I wasted no time gathering my belongings and moved into the new apartment I had already lined up. On my way there, I stopped by the municipal office to officially file the divorce papers. Just like that, I began a new chapter of my life, living on my own without any issues. Living alone, I was struck by the tranquility. There was no one to interrupt my work or ridicule me. Surprisingly, I found that my work was progressing better than usual. Just five days into my new life, I received a call from Kevin while I was working from home. As soon as I answered, Kevin pleaded in the most pathetic voice I had ever heard. Please come home. What's wrong now? I asked. I'm sorry. I apologize, so please come back home, he implored. I'm not coming home. We're already divorced, I replied firmly. I never agreed to a divorce. That's not valid, he protested. But those divorce papers were definitely in your handwriting, I countered. That was just a little threat I was trying to make to you. I had no intention of actually getting a divorce, he explained. That doesn't change the fact that you wrote them. A divorce is a divorce, I stated unequivocally. You don't need a wife who, as you say, plays around every day, works an easy job, and doesn't do any of the house chores. Right now, you get to live with a family you love so much. You can't complain. What's the problem? I'm sorry, was all he could say. Kevin then explained his predicament. My family thinks. I'm a writer, he said, his voice filled with desperation. They quit their jobs and moved here, expecting to live off me. Now they want me to pay for grandma's surgery, and I just don't have that kind of money. I see, I replied, finally understanding why he was so eager for me to return. So that's why you want me back. Yes, now that they've found out I've been lying to them, my parents are furious with me. They're pressuring me to bring you back immediately. You have to understand how difficult this is for me. Please come back. Let's live together again. Do you really think I'm going to say yes after everything? We're divorced, Kevin. You need to handle your real problems, I responded. Don't be like that, Samantha, he pleaded. No matter how many times I reiterated that we were divorced and that he was now a stranger to me, Kevin wouldn't accept the separation. He grasped at any possibility of reconciliation. Finally, in frustration, he said, Fine, I'll divorce you if you insist, but you know what? If you divorce me, you should be responsible for my parents' care and alimony, which you were supposed to help with while we were married. What are you talking about? If you hadn't divorced me, my parents would have ended up in a care facility, and we would have had to pay for it. You should be the one to pay since you pushed for the divorce. They found out I lied about being a successful writer. My parents are angry and emotionally hurt. All of this turmoil is because of your selfish decision to divorce. I can't pay alimony, he added. No, I will pay that, I stated firmly, knowing his troubles were of his own making and not my responsibility to fix. I couldn't grasp what Kevin was trying to imply. When we were married, he'd have called me a jobless, worthless wife. I didn't know if it was his pride speaking or something else, but he was the one who lied about me and caused me pain. Your parents and our relatives believed your lies and blamed me. I don't want to say this, but I was hurt far more than you are now. I'm not interested in someone who ridiculed me instead of defending me. If you need money that badly, why don't you take out a loan from a bank? With those final words, I ended the call without waiting for Kevin's response. I immediately blocked his number and changed my phone. A few months later, I happened to pass by what used to be my in-law's house. It had been sold and converted into a parking lot leaving no trace of the once bustling household. As I stood there, a neighbor returning from shopping approached me. She shared that Kevin's family had been forced to move into an old apartment due to unemployment and financial troubles. Before they left, their constant arguing became well known in the neighborhood, she said. The fights were so loud they could be heard outside, disturbing the peace late into the night. Even the police had to be called a few times. She patted me on the shoulder, sympathizing. You had a tough time too, she said before hurrying off. I turned my back on the remnants of my former in-laws' lives, reflecting on how Kevin's attempts to impress others with lies had spiraled out of control. He couldn't correct his falsehoods and the gap between reality and his fabrications grew wider the more he lied.
I never anticipated our story would end like this. The turn of events in my life proved to be much more interesting than any of the novels Kevin aspired to write. It's strange how small incidents can spiral into catastrophic endings, much like the plots he dreamed of penning. Yet it's ironic that Kevin, who wanted to be a storyteller, couldn't foresee this in his own life. The saying truth is stranger than fiction really holds true here. I do feel a bit sorry for Kevin. He ruined his own life by lying to his parents and chasing after personal glory. But observing him has been a valuable lesson for me. I'm determined to learn from his mistakes, ensuring that I don't fall into the same traps he did. It's a poignant reminder of how crucial it is to remain truthful and avoid building a facade that could one day crumble disastrously.